Welcome to another episode of Going Live with Suarez. With me today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Solana Valverde. She is my life partner. She's a former, former Marine. She's from Hanford, California. How are you doing? I am doing fantastic. How are you? Not too bad. All right. So let's let's get into your story a little bit about your Marine Corps career and how this crazy story happened for you. So you're from Hanford, California. Can you tell us a little bit about how you got recruited and why you chose the Marine Corps specifically? So where I'm from, it's the Valley of California. Everybody associates California with like LA, San Diego, San Francisco. And where I'm from, it's nothing like that. It's agriculture. Um, in Hanford, there's nothing to do. So by the time you're in high school and you're going into that next chapter in your life, most people are either going to school or just working. And I wasn't ready for school, I had money for school. So I made that decision to join the military. Um, and I kind of always knew I wanted to join the military, the Marine Corps specifically. Um, the recruiter that I spoke with kind of solidified the deal for me by not the typical sales pitch. It was just more of being like upfront and blunt, like, hey, this is what it is. You being a female, like this is what you're going to expect with your body type. This is what you're going to expect. and as honest as he was, it helped me realize, like, despite all those, like, things that will be issues for me, I still wanted to do it. And I knew I, like, wanted to go after it. So you, me knowing your family, obviously knowing your details a little more intimate than other people, you know, your, your father and your brother are both in the Navy. Your older sister is a Marine. You could have taken that path of going into the Navy. Like, you have friends who, some of your closest friends that are actual, like, you know, Navy veterans or active duty and even some of your friends in the air force you could have taken that path but you chose to go the hardest route why is it that you chose the marine corps over those other branches i will say that like i kind of always knew i wanted to be marine when i saw a man in uniform i was about eight years old my dad was coming home from a deployment and the first time i saw the dress blues and i was like wow that looks nice and as i got older i wanted to explore more options i did consider the navy as a corpsman at the time i was really set on like going to school for nursing and it i was just not impressed with the navy overall i considered going to the army the air force wouldn't give me the time of day so do you know what the conversation i had with my recruiter was just like okay I've already like you're you're wishy-washy you're indecisive let's put it this way what do you see yourself wearing when you wake up in the morning and I said the Marine Corps uniform he was like there you go and that kind of helped me narrow it down too to know that like I'm doing this based off of like m my will to want to doing this to prove something to myself knowing that these other branches may have given me challenges but something about the Marine Corps just definitely intrigued that for me so every veteran or active duty member has a different story. You know, a lot of families are supportive. Some families, they don't like the idea. Some of them are a little more extreme. How was your family's reception when you told them that you chose the Marine Corps? Um, my mom was kind of, I don't know how to say, she's not a big fan of the Marine Corps, <laughs> but she was proud to know that I'm joining the military after high school. My dad tried to take credit and pushing me in the Marine Corps, which he didn't. Um, they are definitely supportive in the sense of like, they understand that lifestyle and they understand what it means to serve your country. And they weren't gonna hold me back or try to sway me otherwise. Mm -hmm. And after you got, you know, you being a female, it's only been recent that females are allowed at uh, in Pendleton on the West Coast. So you had to go to Paris Island. How were those 12 weeks like for you? Was it difficult? Was it the hardest thing you've ever done or was it a breeze for you? I think physically it was challenging. I'm just not an athletic body type. Mentally, I think it was just nothing compared to what I just grew up in. And I say that because I was in a very strict household. My dad was very harsh on his discipline actions. And so when he did, like the way that the drone instructors would discipline their recruits was nothing for me because I already had that like environment from the get-go. 
but the physical aspect of it was just like running three miles when I'm only used to running like a mile and a half pushing that like physical ability to accomplish those challenges that was difficult um yeah <laughs> I get you I got you so you know with me having also gone to boot camp on the east coast in Paris Island South Carolina we would only get to see you know female marines you know once in a while like when we would go to do like study together at the same time or like maybe we would meet up at, a, at the same obstacle course or the same thing that we're, event that we're going to do for the day but that was it we didn't really hear from you guys. We didn't see you guys. Like, I, I believe your guys' barracks were like on the opposite side of like where the male barracks were. So we, we rarely got to ever see what you guys went through. Do you feel like boot camp is more difficult for a female? Like, is it, do you feel like there's more stacked against the women than it is the men? What do you mean like stacked against the women? Like, for example, like you're, your, your drill instructors would always kind of compare you guys to the males in this in the sense like you told me your senior or your other drill instructors would tell you guys like all eyes are on you because you guys are the women like no one really cares what the guys are doing because it's kind of expected of us to do to either pass or fail but it's like more pressure was put on the shoulders of the female recruits in boot camp do you feel like that was the case yeah absolutely like with the ratio male to female ratio there was just one platoon of a female with like i'm sorry one company two platoons normally on average for a female company while the males have like six seven ten platoons and the reputation that females always especially in the marine corps is that well you know you got a thing between your legs you know you're either like gay bitch or just fucking whatever a whore and instead of trying to morph these females into the typical stereotypes they really did at least my drone instructors really did try to create like you know what just because you're a fucking female doesn't mean that you can't do what these males can but you could do it better you could do it faster you could do it 10 times as much as you want to do it and better yourself i feel like other female platoons i can't speak for the other companies at least with my experience my drill instructors really did of course in the drill instructor ways to implement that like just because you're a female doesn't mean that you're going to get any slack you're going to work twice as hard to earn this title mentally physically emotionally and once you completed the crucible which for people watching that may not know the crucible is the final test the hardest test in marine corps boot camp and once you got that ega put in your hand by whoever it was how was that feeling for you it, i felt like fuck yeah I fucking know I deserve this shit like damn fucking right I deserve this. it was kind of one of those like just give it to me already just give it to me <laughs> like I busted my ass like and I'm not again going back to like my athleticism I'm not the fastest I'm not the smartest but you know what like I could hustle and bustle and get me to point A to point B and me being on the smaller end of like like shorter type body types it was very challenging to keep up with the taller more lean more leaner people so for me I just felt like not necessarily in talent but I know I earned it I worked hard for it absolutely so once you finish boot camp you go back home for a little bit before you end up chipping out to uh, MCT and MOS school during that time that were you kind of planting seeds of what you wanted with your career as a Marine? Did you start kind of setting goals early on of what you wanted for the future of your enlistment? Yes, most definitely. And I think I had that kind of program or like those seeds started during my um, police stages. You know, I kind of already knew that I'm signing a four-year contract and that's all they're going to get from me. I obviously got inspired by drill instructors to see that type of leadership, to see that influence that they had on us recruits. And I'm thinking like, well, maybe I can be a drill instructor. And obviously I'm not one that you know, you did my first four years, but it was just one of those things like you, you do get inspired and you kind of do think of like, where, where can I go in this Marine Corps career? And at the time during MCT, I had a whole lot of hope. I had a lot of optimism to look forward to. 
Um, but I was very still like, I, I want to get my education. I want to go to school for nursing. This is just a, a temporary thing to get me to the next step. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then once you finish MCT and MOS school and you get your orders to find out where you're going and you get told that you're going to Japan, what, like how, how, what went through your head considering you're coming from Hanford, California, which is a small town, especially for California. There's not much of anything from what you tell me. So what was going through your head when you find out that you're going to the other side of the world? I was so fucking stoked to get my ass out of the United States on military money. You know what I mean? Like this is, it, for me, it was just like exciting. Someone who just graduated high school, did three months of training, additional training, went to school, and I'm being told I'm going to cross crunchy in Japan of all places. And as a kid, this is kind of one of those things where like, I would love to go see Japan. And not only did I get to see Japan and obviously as a Marine, but I, I was considered a local. We, we lived there for two years. So it's kind of like, I guess it's called amb ambassadorship. But I, I really enjoy the fact that like, I got the opportunity to live in another country see how things were there and it just opened my eyes especially for someone who's just fresh out of college, uh, high school mm -hmm. so what were some of your favorite things to do in japan or about japan i think the fact that in okinawa it's an island and anywhere you go there's a beach and I love the beach, the calmness, the environment, it's tropical. So anytime you're going out, there's something to do. And I felt like it doesn't matter who you're with, all you have to do is just like, hey, let's go grab something to eat or let's go grab some drinks. That social life of just like anywhere you go, there's something to do, especially with like nature and the water that you're surrounded in. And the waters there are very beautiful. I was very like in love with the nature itself something that you like the sunsets for example the sunsets in japan are nothing like what you see on the west coast or the east coast it's very gorgeous and i felt like although the marine corps made it horrible at times little things like that i could truly appreciate and those are the things that i very much cherished because i had a good time so you and i were both in the same unit you know, your job was different. I was a 3051 warehouse and you were a 3043, what is it called again? The, is it office administrator, office? Supply admin. Okay, so you were a 3043 here in the office. That job that you were doing, you guys were dealing with a lot of money, a lot of big numbers. Were you trained or was that like a big shock to get trained to do a job like that? Specifically coming out of high school. It's not like you were you know, in your mid twenties, having experienced different jobs, you were just kind of thrown in a big, you know, situation and you're just told step up. Like there, there's no other options other than do your job and do it good. Cause otherwise you're going to get, you know, shafted. So how was that experience when you're put into an office and you're getting all this responsibility thrown your way? Well, it, it was a pretty big, significant, like, I don't want to say I was thrown into the wolves or anything like that because I, I did have decent leadership, but the level of hard work that you had to put in there to know the job that I was doing, you know, for us being in the SMU, which is to manage the entire island, we were in a position that like 18, 19 year olds were operating on a very big court, like if you were to translate it like civilian terms, like in a corporate business. So for me to like, for my leadership to explain that, okay, you know what, even though it's the military, you got to think of it as like a business. And what we were doing was such like the bigger picture was just like, whoa. And when I was in the financial management aspect of it, seeing how much money we got to spend and how we were in charge of like, okay, we got this much money that we need to spend by this time, like get it done now. So that pressure quicker of just like meeting these deadlines these time frames and the high paced environment that it was you know that's something you don't typically see after high school unless you get a good job and you've had experience you know like what I did in the Marine Corps for that time frame to compare it to someone else who was doing the financial analysis at an entry-level job you know it was very stressful on top of the fact of 
doing your Marine Corps duties. No, absolutely. Because you, you have a lot of kids that go to college and then do the job that you did. You just had, you know, MOS school, which was what, two months? Something wow. like that, yeah. Exactly. So you're not truly prepared to, you know, for what you're about to see. You're just thrown into the wolves and, you know, good luck. But you also, you were in a weird position because a lot of people who were in our unit stayed at our unit and you didn't. You got shipped up up north to Hanson. Was it Schwab? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hanson. So you got sent up to Hanson to a different unit still to do the same job, but it's, you know, a lot of instability. Did that make your job any harder? No, the, the learning and the experience that I got down at our unit prepared me for like all the other positions afterwards. I would say that by the time I was TAD to Camp Hansen, I was knowledgeable enough to work with the new unit and helping them get the like let's just say for example like their accounting system was so bad that they 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 honestly needed a supply like they needed my position to help them account for their stuff so i felt like with the knowledge that i had from this from our our unit has helped them and helped me in all the other positions afterwards it's just kind of one of those things where like when you learn something and you apply it for all the other positions, it really sets you up for that, okay, the next success. Mm -hmm. And so, like you really, but for me, it, it does. Mm -hmm. So you and I have talked, you know, at length about some of the frustrations that you had while you were in Japan. One of them being the fact that you felt like you were so good at your job and your, your section became so dependent on you they began to interfere with your actual Marine Corps career. So for example, you had got selected to go to, I don't how many exercises, then you get, you got selected to go to Afghanistan, didn't get to go, got selected to go to the Philippines, didn't get to go. Then you say you got it selected to go to like Australia as well. Yeah. So yeah. All, the, all these things <laughs> you got picked to go only to get shafted because you're too essential to your position. Do you feel like, the Marine, was it the Marine Corps or was it the section that kind of prevented that growth while you're in Japan? Good question. I, I don't think it was my section, like my office, my whatever. I think it was more of like the higher ups within the unit where like, I, I remember being a new join and just got assigned to the office and it was between me and another PFC of who's going to Afghanistan. And I was like, hell yeah, I'm gonna go to Afghanistan. They're like, no, we're actually gonna send him. So I was like, okay, great. Well, I, I guess I could learn my job. And it was just like exercise after exercise. They didn't feel that by me going on these exercises would benefit of the office. So I guess in a way it was my section, but I felt like my section really wanted to also give me the opportunity to learn my job and do better at it. That's where I, I got to disagree because it is your section. It is your section. You know, I know that the Marine Corps obviously is the one that has the final say in everything, but coming from where we came from, you weren't the only person that they've done that to. And our leadership and the people in charge of those sections were useless and they didn't know how to do their job and it was pretty sad because even you've seen it where a lance corporal knows 50 times more than a staff nco does and mm -hmm. they would either look at us to do their job for them or they would just do one thing that i saw that was very common in our sections was the higher ups would make the junior marines do all this work and come 11 to 12 o'clock on a friday they'd be out on the golf course so it's, it's not even that it's, you know, it's your, you going on an assignment is going to destroy the whole shop. It's, that's not the case. It's just the fact that these, our leadership was just that lazy. And it's a very common theme in the Marine Corps to be able to take credit for somebody else's accomplishments when they're a lower rank than yours. Because that's the other thing that I was about to ask you, you did a lot for your section sections 
and to include the other unit that you went to that we're going to get into in, in a little bit. You did a lot for these sections only to kind of just get the like, nah, fuck you, you're a shit bag. And they take yeah. credit, credit for what you did. Was, sure. it fr- was it frustrating for you to put in the hours, put in the time, put in the labor, do all the things that you needed to do as a Marine only to have no credit headed your way? Yeah, absolutely. I think one, it's just like, I, I don't know if it was just like, they see me as this like junior Marine that's a female, like I'm that, I don't know, like dumb, dumb, typical female that whatever perception that they had of me at that time. So I, I think that was a big factor of just like, they never took me seriously. And anytime that I performed my job and I, I did the best to my ability, I felt like I was never given the credit or if I was, it, it wasn't, I don't know if to say like meaningful or it was just like, yeah, good job. Like whatever, like fuck off kind of a thing. And I, I remember this one time and it irks me every time I think about it. I was TAD to the unit in Hanson and I was a card holder. So that means that like, I'm the one purchasing stuff I'm the one that like, if anything was to, if there was like any misuse of credit card, whatever, and there was to be an audit done, there would be an audit done on me, which is a very big thing. There was a purchase or a request that I was trying to prevent because it looked like we were taking advantage of the, of the situation. And I try to address this to the requesting office. And I'm thinking like, no, sir, we can't do this. It was the officer taking me being assertive in my position, knowing my job because I've done it for a year and a half as me being disobedient and me being disrespectful. And I took that as like, excuse me, uh, I, the, the fact that I'm using like the regulations and rules that I have to abide by and you're coming at me for being disrespectful and disobedient because I'm not trying to screw myself over and get audited and take my privileges away. I, and I wasn't trying to fight with the officer, but it got to the point where like he brought it up to my OIC, my OIC and my staff and CEOs pulled me inside and kind of asked me what was going on. And I felt like they didn't have my back. I felt that like me being the only 3043 in that office who was helping them and helping the rest of the unit, I felt like where's the support in like me doing my job, but also trying to like play by the rules. You know, it's, it's a very sad situation where our unit that we come from, because those people are very intimidated easily. And the fact that you are so capable at your job being such a low rank compared to theirs, it intimidates them. They don't like it. They feel like undermined because the officers that we had to work for, they all had this weird God complex where everything they did said was right. Everything that we did or said was wrong and when it was right it was because of them not because of us but we were right because of them when we're wrong we're wrong because of us and that's not even just the the officers that's to include the staff ncos the mass sergeants all of that all those all those ranks were just like that you had your your good leadership here and there and i want to kind of you know to to get away from all the negativity give me some positives that you left japan with I, my CEO from fiscal, like, he was phenomenal. I think he put things in perspective for me to understand that as shitty as this can get in the Marine Corps, that as long as we're objective and we understand what it is that we're doing and how it's impacting the organization overall, and to stay like objectively focused on those things, that we can make it through these shitty times. And having that mindset and having that type of leadership teach me that thing has really gotten me to where I'm at now. I think that as far as female, like leadership, there really wasn't a whole lot that it's, I never really had a female leader to look up to, to be honest. And I kind of wish there was, I wish there would have been some type of female leadership that would make junior female Marines feel like I want to be just like her. And there wasn't any. And as far as males, I mean, it's not that great because they already have that preconception of females and how they are. But 
going back to the like positive leadership, I think there were some mainly like the ones that are family oriented. I felt like they were definitely more open to leading Marines like me and not being so harsh to judge and have that like, again, perception of female Marines. Mm -hmm. No, and, and you know, that you were right in about the perception of male Marines when the perception that they have towards females. And do you feel like, both in Japan and once you made it to Virginia, which was your next unit after Japan, do you feel like your voice as a woman was ignored specifically because you were a woman? Or is it just like, just the amount of ignorance that some men carry with them when they're dealing with people? Yeah, I agree with, with what you're saying. I think that like, maybe one or two like staff and CEOs really in like a, a, a chief foreign officer were the only like difference and okay you know what he's a female I'm gonna take her in like they treated me and saw me as a, like a daughter or someone that they respect majority of the males which is like 90 percent of them were fucking douchebags you know I had a fucking marine that I worked with you know who I thought was my friend or like called as my friend you know who like so not even six months on the island already like stating and yeah I'm pretty sure she didn't get pregnant six months like what the fuck like we work together you're supposed to take care of me like I thought that's the whole point of like the marine corps and the camaraderie watching out for each other and I don't know if it's because of these like personal issues or if it's like more on like that again marine corps of like yeah females psh, yeah they're just fucking whores and I don't know I kind of feel like it's both like they definitely have that what you said mm -hmm. right so once you got to Virginia and you know you gave your unit a little bit of a try how far into you being at your this new duty station did you know that you wanted to get out I knew when I was in Japan that I wanted to get out mm -hmm. it was more clear by the time I went to Virginia that I was struggling I remember not even a few months into my new unit and and I was stationed in Quantico where like and I, I hate to say this because as much as I enjoy and I'm proud to be a Marine this is one of the most lowest points I've had as a Marine I was putting on my camis on my blouse and I'm buttoning up and I'm thinking like god damn I want to fucking cry because I hate this shit I hate this fucking thing I hate this like bullshit that I had to eat and get told and have to be a certain way and still get discredited as my efforts aren't shit. I'm still the shit bag when I know I'm out of fucking shit bag. And the sergeant at the time, he was TAD, so he wasn't my actual sergeant, but he saw that when I walked in and he took me aside and was asking, like, hey, devil dog, what's going on? And I told him, I was like, I woke up this morning, put on my blouse, and I was very defeated. Like, I don't, I feel guilty for even saying this but I, I don't feel proud to be a marine right now mm -hmm. and try to give me this pep talk and I'm not going to say it helped but it was just like okay I hear him out and towards half the year or like half I would say like six months within my new unit I was just like so done with the bullshit I got some trouble um I had to I had this female staff and CEO, like I just, I did not respect. I understand her like mentality of like female Marines need to be better and show off whatever. But I just had like, again, no female leadership that I respected. And it was just, I don't know, like morally, I was just done by the time I went to Quantico. Yeah, I mean, knowing your story and knowing how everything kind of unfolded, you did bring some of the shit that you had, you brought it up on yourself. And, you know, that's harsh to say, but some of the stuff you did bring on yourself. However, the Marine Corps and the leadership, at least when we were in, was not about let's fix this Marine and let's work on, on creating a better version of that man or that woman. The ones that the ones that we got, you know, taught by or the ones that we had to work under, they were all about let's kick them while they're down. And that's what your unit in Virginia ended up doing to you. There was that, like, how do I put it? There was like that those 
NCOs that would once in a while, you could tell that they wanted to make that difference with you and help you. But the way it always works in the Marine Corps, it's the chain of command. And it's the ones that are on top. Those are the ones who ultimately dictate how you're going to get treated and what they're going to do with you. And what they chose to do with you was, hey, we have a Marine here that knows how to run the whole shop because you knew how to do things that your sergeant had no idea how to do, that your staff sergeants had no idea how to do, that even your fucking captain had no idea how to do. The fact that they can call you a piece of shit and a shit bag and that you're a bad Marine, but they come to you every single day to tell, ask you how to do their job for them. Come on. Yeah. What, what, that, that's why the Marine Corps has such low morale and it loses so many amazing workers that it could so many amazing Marines, not just people who are good at working, but Marines overall. And they're the ones that ensure that those Marines leave. And that's what they did with you. Instead of helping you out, instead of trying to right the ship or see what was you know going on, they're just like, fuck it, let's just make her life even worse. Let's mess yeah. with her in every way that we can. And that was just their response to everything. And that's why I said, why do you think you have situations like the whole Vanessa Gillen? And it's not, and it's not just a Marine Corps or it's not just an army. It's just a military thing in general, but it's, it's, uh, it's sad because you, I do believe that you were one of those Marines, like other friends that of mine that I've interviewed who have gotten out. And I'm like, dude, like you would have made a difference in how things are in the culture. Not, not necessarily, obviously like in how the Marine Corps is run and how they operate but you, the culture, the changing culture is what is most important in my opinion. And mm -hmm. I don't know, like, do you, do you feel like not just you, but other Marines that you've seen have been pushed out when they could have made that change to the organization? Yeah, absolutely. 100%. Like all I can say here and say is that like the Marine Corps missed out on a bunch of great potential leadership on the way to, innovate and change the way that the Marine Corps could have been heading. I hear now that like the Marine Corps is awful. It's getting worse. Most people are like trying to get out or, you know, people stay in because they don't know what to do, but they still hate it. And I'm just thinking like, you know what, as, as shitty as it is, it worked out. It worked out for me because at the end of the day, like they were no longer serving my purpose and they would have could have shut it. Like, fuck you guys. Like, this is what you guys were the Marine Corps is now is because of what they did and to so many Marines like myself and the people that you know and that I know. Right. And, and then, you know, so some people might hear that and go like, that's so selfish of you to say, but until they, they know, actually know and understand how these things are, the Marine Corps doesn't give a shit about us. I don't, I don't care. Again, not just the Marine Corps, the military does not care about you. You're just a number. You're just a body. You're, you're just something and someone that they can squeeze the juice, the life juice out of you. And once you have mm -hmm. no more, it's just buy, buy trash. And that's how it is. Sadly, do you think there's anything that can currently change even something small that would benefit enlisted, whether it's have their voices heard to have more input, something along those lines? <laughs> I think it really just stems from the immediate direct leadership. So junior Marines and their relationship with their NCOs, how is that? How are the NCOs getting those junior Marines involved and how are they guiding them? I think that if their staff and NCOs involved, that's great, but it's not necessarily the staff and NCOs to do what the NCOs should be doing. And I felt like with my experiences, these NCOs were the same age as me who didn't know anything and got that like power hungry authority and they took advantage of that instead of like truly leading and changing the way that the future of the marine could be um i think that marines or junior marines that feel they're being taken advantage and, and i wish that i was more assertive i wish i would have done some things differently where i felt like you know i was walked over on a lot of the time and I, I would have stood up for myself so I would feel like junior marines that feel that way speak up who gives a shit speak up you know we preach this like look out for one another and you know always do the right thing mm -hmm. yeah it's it's difficult and it's scary especially for junior marines for those younger guys that are just starting out because 
even though they tell us all the time that there's rules and there's things that protect us, there ain't shit. You know, these people revel in the fact that they can abuse their rank, that they can silence a, a private or a lance corporal because eh, who cares? You know what I mean? So it's it's very difficult for these guys or, and women to speak out when they're just ignored. They're ignored to yeah. the fullest. And it's a it's a it's a very shitty situation. But, you know, another thing that they used to do to everybody that was especially talking about getting out is they would always tell us you're going to be nothing without the Marine Corps. You're going to be a fucking loser. You're going to be a piece of shit. You're going to be working at McDonald's. You're going to be living under a bridge. Your life is going to be meaningless and worthless. If you're not wearing the, the, the camis and the EGA every day, you just, you finish your bachelor's, you finish your master's a couple of weeks ago. You're working in a great government job that, you know, you're making your, your way up the ranks. You know, do you ever feel like with the things that you've accomplished, is that like a, like a fuck you to all those haters that you once had in the Marine Corps telling you, Valverde, you're going to be a waste of life. If you don't reenlist, pointless. How do you feel now that you've accomplished what you've accomplished? You got out in 2015? Yeah. Right? So you got out in 2015. In six years, look at all that you have accomplished. How does that feel knowing what you were being told? as you're leaving the Marine Corps and look where you are now. It feels fucking great. It validates, you know what? Like, bitch, I fucking knew I was better than that shit. Like, I felt like what I'm doing now and the organization that I'm doing it for, like the Marine Corps missed out on a fucking goddamn like good candidate to, to make a difference. And to know that the people that I knew on a personal level, like I had those interactions professionally or prof like personally, those who like the naysayers and like people that talk shit behind my back, it's the biggest fuck you. And I don't give a shit about what you have to say anymore because like, look where I'm at right now. Like I'm not speaking out of arrogance because I will never do that, but it's just like, it gives me that boost of confidence that you know what, like I let you in my ear, but you know what? I, I've pushed myself to this point where it's like, fuck you guys. I, I did it. And without your fucking help, mm -hmm. you guys make great, like I said, a great candidate to make a difference. And I'm taking like my talents and my skill sets elsewhere and deuces. But you got to realize too, Solana, everything that you accomplished in the, in the, in the Marine Corps was because of you. It wasn't because your staff and CO was yelling at you. It wasn't because, you know, you had the pressure of getting NJP'd or because you're trying to get up in rank or whatever. All the things that you were able to do for your shops was directly off of your knowledge, off of your brain, off of your sweat, off of everything that you did yourself. They're not the ones that were typing in and staying long hours with you. They're not the ones that were doing the things that you were doing. So you've been doing it for a while. It's just the Marine Corps conditions us to just believe that everything that we're doing or everything that we're capable of doing or that we did is because of them. Like they want to pretend like, and, and here's the thing, I will give the Marine Corps all the credit in the world of what it's done for me of the things that I'm, I've been able to do since the Marine Corps, like go to finish, go to college, all those things is because of the Marine Corps. Obviously it's, it was a transaction. I gave them four years of my life to, to do with me as they fucking please. And yeah, they did it. But now, you know, I've, I've accomplished my stuff and it's helped and it's come from the Marine Corps help and the things that, you know, they offered me and yeah, but everything that you've done comes from you and you, you don't owe it to anybody. And if you feel like bragging, do it because you deserved it. And it's been a long journey in those six years with everything that has gone on in, in our life and in your individual life. All these things has, have, has been a, a crazy path, but you've done it and you've done it mm -hmm. amazingly. So you got to feel proud about yourself because I know me, I'm proud of you. I, I know your family's proud of you. And yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a fuck you to all the haters, but it's a fuck you that you deserve to give. Yeah, yeah, I I agree, and you know sometimes like I have the hardest part, like remembering to pat myself on the back, and you know as you're talking, I had I remember this like one conversation I had with my sergeant where like he saw uh, how defeated I was, I felt like I wasn't given credit, and he was just like, "Hey, that's corporal already, pat yourself on the back." So it. Yeah. <laughs> but it, it, you're right, and um. Sometimes I just, I get so caught up in like 
just moving and doing something that I, I, I don't give myself credit. And it, it does feel nice to say, like, fuck you guys. I did it, bitch, without you. <laughs> you know, because it, 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 like I said, it's it's been a difficult journey. It hasn't been easy these last six years accomplishing all the things that we're trying to do together and individually. You know, as a veteran, now that you've gone through college, colleges, you know, like I said, you finish your bachelor's and your master's. Well, how do you feel like life as a veteran was for you? <laughs> I personally believe the minute that I got out, the real challenges began. I felt, and I say this all the time, like my college experience, like being a veteran was more challenging than the Marine Corps. I felt in the Marine Corps, it's an institution with a very like structure and order of like, you're told what to do, when to do it, and how to do it, and it, it, it's like a, a mindless thing of, like, you know what you're expected to do, so go do it. Now you're kind of put out into the real world, uh, figuring out, like, not necessarily survival mode, but how are you going to make a life for yourself? How are you going to provide and create, you know, one, pay the bills, and you're, take care of your essential needs, and then you know, once you got that met, like, what do you really want to do in your life? Like that self-discovery journey aspect of it. That was very difficult for me. You know, I, I felt like I thought I was going to be a psychiatric nurse going to nursing school and working in a psych ward <laughs> one semester in. And I'm realizing like, okay, maybe not. Well, let me switch my major. Um, you know, and I focused on media and communications for a while. And I'm thinking like, you know what, like, let me be smart with my GI Bill and just say, fuck it, I'm a study in liberal studies. And, you know, I got my bachelor's in three years and whatever remaining uh, GI Bill that I had, I used it towards my master's. I, I never thought I was gonna get my master's, you know? It, it wasn't until I had a conversation with a professor from Hong Kong where he's like, have you ever thought about getting your master's? No. And little stuff like that where it's just like, Whenever you have that plan in your mind as you're transitioning from the military and you're getting out, not that plans always go accordingly, but it doesn't. And you're kind of having to figure it out as you go. And that for me was very difficult because it's like, I was so used to having that structure and now I'm kind of having to figure it out on my own. Yeah, well, you got, we got to give credit to the Marine Corps here. Honestly, we got to give credit to the Marine Corps because even though the Marine Corps does give us a structure in a sense of putting these, you know, rules, regulations, standards, all that stuff, you know, getting that, that steady paycheck that most people don't have. Those are all forms of structure that we get used to, but structure, yeah. structure in the sense of our work life, our work and, you know, personal life, there is absolutely no structure. When you go to a job itself in the Marine Corps, it might be good. It might be bad. It might be fucking World War Three. You never know. And that weird, like, unknown from the Marine Corps where we didn't know what, you know, we we're going to walk into. Every day was a different day in the Marine Corps for our job wise. I think that's what has helped us deal with the unexpected, I don't know, curveballs that life throws our way. Because one day... You know, we're headed in one direction and then life decides, you know what? <laughs> no, nope. we're going we're going to send you guys over here now. You think you're going this way? Bye. So I think those that instability from the Marine Corps of not having a regular job, you know, where people clock in at nine and they leave by five and they have, you know, a lunch break and they have four small little breaks in between. That was not the Marine Corps. Like there'd be days where. You show up at six in the morning and you leave at four in the afternoon or you get there at six in the morning and you're not leaving until two in the morning. You know what I mean? So it's, it's that kind of weird instability that built the, the sort of character or ability to navigate this like unexpected, unexpected world. Because once you get out of the Marine Corps, you do feel like a dog without a leash. You're just, you're like, like a dog. That's just like, if they let me off this motherfucker, I'm just going to run. I'm going to run and I'm going to go have fun, but that's not the mm -hmm. case. You, you get out, you get out of the Marine Corps and you're just kind of like, uh, you, oh shit. And then it's, it's, it's an error and trial kind of thing. Trial and error yeah. kind of lifestyle. But you know, it, it is what it is, man. Cause 
I can't be prouder than all the things you have done in this time, all the things that you're demonstrating that you're capable of when people told you that you weren't, you're proving people wrong and you're proving the right ones right. So, you know, uh, not to get too mushy here, but love you, I'm proud of you. I appreciate you coming on and talking to me and, you know, being honest and telling your story. So thank you. Thank you. All right. Love you. You too. <laughs>